How important is a bucket? Depends, right? And so the other night I went to a meeting with Rudy Moberg, and I don't know if you know Rudy Moberg. Rudy and I have been friends for, gosh, 30-something years, and known Rudy and his family. One of his daughters was my intern one summer, and now she's an important lawyer person, and his son's not here this morning to hear me harass him. But, but Rudy uh, had a stroke this year, and, but he has got a heart for a new ministry, and so he met with a bunch of guys, and, and I got to be a part of that. And Rudy, in a wheelchair, holds up a bucket, and he says... God will pour himself into any container if you'll let him. And I'm going to talk a little bit about broken containers in a minute, but I got to thinking about just different containers. You got somebody left their Contigo cup or whatever this is, Walmart cup. And then we've got this kind of cup. And then, of course, those who have preschoolers, right? (laughs) Right? And which one of these is more important? Depends what you're doing, right? Too many times we think, well, I'm just a sippy cup. But you've got to realize to somebody, this is the most important cup today. And to those who've come here to church and know the pastor's getting ready to talk for a little while, this is the most important cup to them. If they're going to stay awake for the sermon By the way, lots of Dolphin fans here today. You're welcome for me leaving fandom for that team. And of course, this one for the car, right? And this one for multi-purposes, whether you're mopping a floor or doing something else. Years ago, the Japanese learned an art. i got to look up the name because I'm I'm a little slow. Uh, It's called Kintsugi, I think is how you pronounce it. I haven't worked on my uh, uh, Japanese, so that's as close as you get. You can correct me later. But it's the art that when something is broken, like a vase is broken or a bowl is broken, of putting it back together with gold. And actually, the real bowls and the real vases or vases, depending on where you're from. I said vase last night, and somebody said, do you mean vase? And I said, vase. Thank you, Thurston Howell. (laughs) Right? Whichever. But the truth is, those Bowls and vases and other things that come from that place where they do that artwork are actually more valuable than they were when they started. So let me tell you about you. Because whether you know it or not, a lot of people get discouraged this time of year. Uh, People lose hope. Today's theme is hope from Advent. People see other people happy, they, they look on Facebook and they think, well, I'm not as happy as them, my life is hard. And they think about their hard things in life. Everybody has hard things. Do you, Anybody in here have hard things going on? Okay, I know some of your hard things. I don't know all of and you don't know all of my hard things. Some of my close friends know a few of my tough things right now that are really hard, uh, to the point that I didn't want to come to church last night, if that tells you anything. I had too much going on. I thought, oh, maybe I just won't go. That's a good thought for the pastor, right? <laughs> and so, so the truth is, for all of us, we all have those moments. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants to tell you that whatever container you are, it's, you have no value. You are broken. You are messed up. But let me tell you a, a big secret. We're all broken. And the truth is, peace By peace, not all the pieces at once, I wish God was a microwave God. It would be great if you just became a Christian and said, Jesus, fix everything. And he's like, boof, you will never drive like that again. I actually heard a pastor, famous pastor yesterday tell a story about after his first sermon, he got in a fight with a guy on the way home from his first sermon sermon and i'm like that's yeah it was probably an angel that god sent just to mess with him like yep think you did a good job huh gabriel take him out you got it and the truth is for all of us we're all broken we have pieces we have things and 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 sometimes god puts those pieces back and we think oh i got this one down now and guess what it gets broken again 
Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's a hurt that we thought we dealt with. Maybe it's a painful childhood. Maybe it's painful people. Maybe it's people in your life that seem to be, oh, those pieces are getting back together, and then you're like, oh, no. And yet God puts us back together. And the truth is he puts us back together more valuable, stronger than we were before. And so I don't care if you're a sippy cup or a bucket or a gold vase. I want you to know that God can use you if you allow him to pour himself into you. And then as you go, you say, God, let me or help me to pour what you've poured into me into others. Help me to be salt and light. Help me to be blessing. Because today we're going to talk about this idea that God provides and how he provides as we look at the Christmas story and how God had a plan way ahead of time in the middle of darkness, in the middle of destruction, in the middle of terrible days. Are you having a bad day? In the middle of bad days, God has a plan. And he can even use what you think is broken now to make a difference down the road. To do something that could never be done without your brokenness, without your failure, without your mess up. Now, I'm not saying fail and stay there. Too many people say, well, a perfect church for imperfect people. I should try to be imperfect. Let me tell you something. You don't have to try that. You'll, you'll do that when you're working on righteousness and holiness. So work on righteousness and holiness. The imperfection will come, and God will work on humility. So here's how God provides. I'm going to talk today about the fact that you're never too broken for God to use you. I've seen God over the years use broken, messed up vessels. People, and I'll be honest, people God probably shouldn't have used. I think, God, you could have used a better person than that. And God looks at me like, yeah. So number one, God gives life through Christ. And I want you to look at the most unusual Christmas story. It's the book of John. And this is how John tells the Christmas story. He says, it's not far enough back to go to the manger. Let's go even farther back. And so we're picking up John chapter 1. We'll start with 1 through 5 and then we'll skip over to 14. In the beginning was the word. And that's where we get the word logos. It means living word. It's talking about Jesus here. One of the cults actually changes the words to these verses to fit their theology. But I would encourage you, don't do that. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, which means the rest here. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. By the way, it doesn't take much light to cast out darkness. Have you noticed that? Most of you, if you got married... If you're a darkness person, if you like to sleep in total darkness, you married a spouse who likes a nightlight. You can see in the dark and they can't. I'm the nightlight spouse. Not because I'm scared of the dark, but I leave my shoes on the floor. I know, they're my shoes. I got gotcha. you. And I trip over them every time. But it is amazing how I can just push just a little bit of light on my watch and avoid the shoes. Or whatever else I left. Just a little bit of, and that's you. When, when God pours his light into you, you think, but Eric, I'm not very bright. And I know some of you are saying, Eric, you're not very bright. I get it. But the truth is just a little bit of light. You may not think you're a witness to the people who are around you. And you may feel like, but Eric, I barely have my act together. And many days I don't have my act together. But that light that God has poured into your life, you would be surprised at how that stands out to your friends. How that stands out to your family. Why? Because he's pouring light into you. And then it continues. In it was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A few verses later, the word became flesh. This is what we celebrate at Christmas time. And made his dwelling among 
us. And I love how it goes plural here. He dwells among us. God with us. That's what Christmas is really about. Are you feeling lonely during this season? Have you lost somebody you care about? Are you remembering something that's causing you pain? You are not alone. Christmas is about God with us. By the way, sometimes the best thing you can do is to get around another Christian who can remind you that not only you are you not alone because they're your friend, but you're not alone because they can demonstrate that Christ is with you too. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, and I love this, full of grace and truth. We tend to be full of either grace, like, oh, it's okay, or truth. Get out here right now. We tend to not have grace and truth. Jesus was the perfect balance of telling the truth, but doing it in grace. That's why truth and love shows maturity as believers. We either tend to speak the truth, not always in the nicest way, or we tend to just be loving and not necessarily speak the truth, which isn't very loving. Jesus was balanced. You are meant to be full of light. When Jesus comes into your life, that light comes into you. You get to see what God has done. You get to get a glimpse of what God is doing. And you carry that with you everywhere you go, even on your darkest day. Sometimes it just feels like a little watch battery light. And sometimes it might feel like a huge lighthouse. But the truth is, even on those moments when life is very dark, that's when that light shines the brightest and you say, God, I just need you. I need your presence. By the way, if you're praying for your friends who are struggling, one of the things that's great to pray is, God, would you give them your presence God, would you just let them know that you're there? Would you, would you speak to them in such a way that they know you're around? I know, I know all of us have somebody, somebody we know that's struggling. So pray that for them. Lord, would you give them your presence? Because when God brings that light into our lives, it changes us on our worst day, in our hardest moment, in the most difficult time, his light can walk us through. And by the way, when you carry that to somebody else and you go to encourage them, you're not just encouraging them by yourself. Guess what? You're bringing Jesus with you and bringing courage with you to help that person. And by the way, sometimes somebody just needs to know, I understand. You're loved. In James 1.18, it says, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Did you know you're first fruits? I had a pastor one time years ago call me in his office. He said, God told me to tell you something. I'd never had that happen. I thought, oh, well, I better hear what this is. What's it going to be? I said, what did God tell you? He said, God told me to tell you you're a pest and you bother people. <laughs> well, that's not exactly what I thought he was going to say, but okay. Now, I have learned over the years that there are people like that. And in Greek, they're called doufasi. Doofus. You don't believe those people. And I will say that there are some of you who maybe as children, maybe as adults, maybe as you've gone through life, somebody has told you you're in the way, you're trouble, you're a problem, you're a pest. <laughs> You bother people. Maybe everywhere you go, it could be that you tell yourself that. Oh, I don't want to bother anybody. If those are some of the main words out of your mouth, then you grew up with somebody who told you you were in the way. How dare you only have one TV? Get out of the way. Which, by the way, was the number one phrase in the 70s. I don't know if you knew that. I knew that. Move. But I want you to know your first fruits, this verse says, you're not leftovers. And here's what's funny. So yesterday, when we're talking about the bucket, yesterday, I like to cut up apples for Kristen. She works late hours on, on those odd weekends. So she's working late, and she worked late last night. And so I've got a new, my mom got me this new cutter thing, and it's awesome. It cuts the apples perfectly. And so I'm cutting these apples, and I didn't realize that if you try to go too fast, it flings the apples across the room. It's very exciting, but... but the apples end up on the floor, and then you have to do the, hmm, no, they're wet. I can't pick them up. So, so I didn't even think about putting them back in the bucket. 
I took those apples and I immediately threw them away, right? But can I tell you, if that was gold flakes and I dropped some on the floor, can I promise you I would have picked the gold flakes up? Quit thinking that you're old apples to God and that he's just putting up with you. You are apples of gold in settings of silver. You are God's best. You are the first fruits of all he's created. You're not the leftovers. You're not in the way. You're not bothering God with your prayers. God's not in heaven going, oh boy. No, he goes, you are first fruits. I've given you the bucket that you have, and I'm going to pour my gold. I'm going to pour my light into you for me to use it. And don't let anyone tell you differently. Number Two, God, are you still surprised a pastor would say that to me? He did apologize to me later. That made up for it. <laughs> Number two, God prepares the way for his will. You ever had a big failure in life? Years ago, I did a failure trip. You ever had a failure trip? If you haven't had a failure trip, you're just no fun. You've never been a youth pastor. So I was a college pastor at a church, going to do a first big uh, uh, ski trip to try to get new kids involved. And sure enough, half the kids that signed up were brand new students that I had never met. They were going to come on our ski trip with us. And that meant that I had opportunity to share the gospel with them, to tell them about Jesus, to see where they were at. So I had all these kids. We filled up a bus. We left for the trip. We got to North Carolina. No, no, we went to Virginia. And we got there and the bus froze. I mean froze. It was 19 below zero. You walk out and you see crystals, which coming from Miami was a big difference for me. I was like, what? And so we're going down the road and the bus locks up and the rear end of the bus falls out of the bus and the bus stops and will not go on a curve. Trucks are coming around. I thought we are dead. But the good news is there was a blinker truck that came up and redirected all the cars. Tow truck shows up. 19 below zero, and the guy says, you're all going to have to get out of the bus for me to tow this. To which I said, no, we'll just wait. He said, there's nobody else. I'm the guy. This is, it was West Virginia, I just realized. Well, this is West Virginia. There is nobody out here. It's me. And I said, well, I don't know what we're going to do. Do you have another bus? He laughed and laughed. He said, I'll tell you what, we'll just tow you down the mountain with you all in the bus. By the way, you're not supposed to do that. But we did it. I wish I had video of it. Because any time that bus bounced, sparks would shoot up out of that truck over the top of the bus. It was awesome. <laughs> we got to the bottom of the hill. Thankfully, I was able to rent rooms for the night. But we had students that had exams. They were so mad. Oh, my goodness gracious. We had students that got sick. We had all kinds of problems. We got home a few days later, and I remember thinking, what a failure of a trip. I love Facebook. <laughs> I mean, I hate Facebook, but I love Facebook for this reason. On that trip, two of those students that didn't know each other one was from New Jersey, had the full New Jersey accent. The other was from Arkansas, had eaten possum. I mean, you know, one of those Arkansas people. Those two, she had a boyfriend, but those two on that trip started talking. They got to talking and fell in love with each other. I did their wedding. They now have three children and live, you ready, in Hawaii. Was my trip a failure? No. And not just because of that. Other kids came to Christ. I got to know other kids better. Can I tell you I was frustrated? Can I tell you I felt like a failure? And so I say all that to say this. You might feel like a failure today. You, you may be upset that things are not going the way you thought they'd go. Those pieces aren't falling together the way you thought they'd fall. Things feel very broken and falling apart. But God can and will Prepare the way for his will. Read this next part. This is from Isaiah. And in Isaiah, they're dealing with difficulty and challenge. And Isaiah is warning them 
about what's to come that is bondage and, and isolation and being taken captive. And he's warning them about all this stuff. And then he goes into this and he says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Now we know who that is. That's John preparing the way for Christ. And so Isaiah is saying, even though things are terrible right now, there's going to come a day that God himself is going to come in the form of the Messiah. Jesus is coming. Prepare the way for the Lord. And then he continues, make straight in the desert a highway for God. Every valley will be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged place is a plain and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and the people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And then in the New Testament, this actually happens. And Zechariah goes into the temple to serve God. And an angel shows up. And Zechariah makes a mistake that I want to challenge you never to make. Zechariah tells the angel, I think you're lying. And the angel says, fine, you're not going to talk until the baby's born. So for months, Zechariah gets to do Pictionary with everyone. And finally, Zechariah gets to speak, and he sings a song. La, 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 la. Sorry. All right, here we go. And you, my child, you just showed your age if you knew that song, by the way. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you'll go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give the people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness. And in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew, became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. And you remember that John cried out that he was the one preparing the way for the Lord. He's the one that said, there's the Messiah. The one who I don't even deserve to tie his shoes. God had to make Zechariah be quiet to prepare him. Sometimes the reason God allows that humbling in your life, that failure, that getting in a fight on the way home from church, <laughs> that, that thing that happens that makes you humble is to get you quiet so you realize, God, I need you. And you do need him. He, you don't put your pieces back together yourself. God has to do that. And God's the one who brings the gold. And so you allow him to put the pieces back together. Number three, finally, God heals and uses broken people. Some of you are tired physically today. You're tired of the way your body's acting. Some of you, it's mental. You're, you're struggling. Some of you, it's emotional. You struggle with your emotions. You go from one side to the other. It's okay to be broken. That's the human condition. We're not in heaven yet. Whenever you start to wrestle with those questions, why am I this way? Then your answer needs to be, because I'm not in heaven yet. Someday he'll wipe all the tears away, but in the meantime, there's tears. Otherwise, he wouldn't have to wipe them away. And so if you have tears today, know that even in that, he's still working. I love the story of Jesus. Matthew does, starts out the gospel this way. When he talks about the story of Jesus, he goes back through the history of Jesus' heritage and he points out all the messed up people in the line of Jesus. And he says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. By the way, it just happens to be a prostitute. Just so you know. Now she repented. She got her life right. She gave her life to, to God at that point. Became Jewish. But he's pointing out, guess what? Even Jesus' heritage had to go a long way. And then he continues, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. You know that story. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. Now listen to the way he says this next sentence. David was the father of Solomon. Now he could have said whose mom was Bathsheba. But he thought he would make it even more pronounced. He said, whose mother had been the holy man, the righteous man, the guy who led his troops, Uriah's wife, reminding all of the readers of what David did. And yet God said, David, even in your sin, even with your brokenness, you have repented 
and I will use even you. Why? Because David had a heart after God. The biggest difference between David and Saul was not that either one was more righteous than the other. It was that Saul became arrogant and blamed everyone else, and David became humble and said, God, it's against you. I have sinned. So he says, it's been Uriah's wife. And then a few verses later, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. I want you to beware of anyone who thinks they have their act together. They're selling you something. Beware of anyone who thinks they got to where they are on their own. Because the truth is, we all need grace, we all need others, we all need God's power. That's what those verses are demonstrating. Hemingway said this, the world breaks everyone. Afterwards, many are strong in broken places. I heard this, your brokenness is not a list of why God can't use you, but a resume of why he can. Have you messed up? Have you broken? The enemy will rub it in your face and say, you're a failure. The good news is God uses failures. You're a donkey. All through the Bible, God uses donkeys. I always say, you know, Balaam had a donkey who spoke, and here on every Sunday morning, you see one. I was talking about Brian. Are y'all talking about me? Why do they look at me? I thought, oh, well. Romans 8 tells us the real story. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. By the way, it doesn't say God works to the good of those who do whatever they want. Those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Those God foreknew, he predestined to be, what's the purpose? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And here's the deal about your broken bucket. Your broken bucket does not matter as much as what's inside of it. I want you to continue to let God put the broken pieces together. Let him put them back together with gold. But in the meantime, recognize that God can pour his life into your broken, messed up bucket with the phone ringing. I know it's, I know it's 11. Every time a bell rings... Oh, sorry. Way to go. All right. That a boy, Clarence. That's what it was. I couldn't remember the line. I saw the, I saw the picture. This week, I had somebody who's really busy talking to me. And they said, I realized something today. They said, where I work, I'm always in a hurry, getting to the next thing, getting to the next thing, getting to the next thing. And today, I stopped to listen to people, to encourage them, to ask them about their families, to ask them about people. And they said it made such a difference. I could tell that it really blessed them that I just took a few minutes for them. Listen, your broken, messed up bucket. When God pours his life into you, sometimes just stopping what you're doing, texting somebody, calling somebody, Looking at somebody in their face and saying, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? Is there anything I can help you with? When you do that, God's grace pours out from you to bless someone else. Don't underestimate your value. Don't underestimate that God has prepared the way. And he's put the people in your life, the place that you work, the neighborhood that you live in, even the family that you have, for you to pour out what he's put into you onto them. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means that Jesus came and died for our sins. And that when we say, Jesus, I want to follow you, and we surrender our lives to him, the Bible says he takes our sins and gives us his righteousness. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you've been discouraged. Or maybe you've just gotten your eyes on the wrong things. Hey, ask God this week. God, would you use me to pour out your light, your love on other people this week? Let's close in prayer.
Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. I thank you for preparing the way, not just for me, but for our church, for the people that are here, for the things that are happening in our lives, for the community that you're bringing to know you, for these new neighbors that are coming and showing up at church, and for the new people you're bringing to serve. But Lord, most of all, we thank you this time of year for sending your son so that we could know you. Lord, help us to know you more. I do pray for that friend who's hurting, that they would have your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen.